In this section, we're going to install PHP MyAdmin, which is a great management tool for MySQL type DBMSs. In fact, it focuses exclusively on MySQL. PHP MyAdmin can be used to administer a local instance of MySQL via the web browser, and it supports many of the common DDL and DML type SQL statements that you'll need to run to manage your MySQL instance. We're going to navigate to the home page for the project, which is located at phpmyadmin.net, and we'll find the latest download. And while it's downloading, we'll configure Apache. We'll install it, then configure it. When downloading packages from the net, when you're presented with options or com files that are of various compression types, select the compression type that provides the smallest footprint. And that generally is BZIP2 BZIP in comparison to GZIP and ZIP. So we'll go ahead and get the GZIP2 version from a local mirror. And phpMyAdmin, when we get it, will be downloaded and stored in a directory. phpMyAdmin is distributed as a compressed file, but once decompressed, it contains numerous PHP files which are to be placed in a web accessible location on your server. Let's find the mirror in North America. Here's one in Minnesota, here's a closer one in Georgia. And this should suffice. We should have this momentarily. We'll wait for the pop-up to indicate that it wants to save the file to somewhere on the disk and we'll save it. And once it's down we'll unzip it. Now before we can go off unzipping and accessing PHP MyAdmin, we need to ensure that we do have Apache installed. So from the shell, let's confirm that Apache is installed. And if it isn't, we'll need to install it. Well, RPM, query all, grep, case insensitive, Apache. It's actually Apache 2, but you'll see that it is not installed and we'll need to install it. We have two options to install Apache or two easy options either using YAST from the text interface or YAST from the graphical interface either or will allow us to install Apache let's go ahead and launch the graphical version of YAST which will prompt us for the administrator's password and once in we'll navigate to software then software management and then search for the Apache program any dependencies will be resolved by YAST automatically in order to provide support for Apache. We'll maximize this to take full use of the screen and then simply search for Apache. There are many Apache packages but the main package is the Apache 2 package. By simply clicking on Apache 2 we'll be prompted for dependencies such as whether or not we want to use pre-fork as a method of invoking Apache processes using the multiprocessing model, module that is. We'll click accept you'll see it pop up. Pre-fork is the default Live APR zero is also required, and we'll need to, to give the server CD number three, unless you have the RPMs accessible at a location. So we're going to go ahead and pop that CD in, and we've popped it in. So we'll click OK to have the files copied. Now momentarily, we'll have PHP support on the system, which is what's required to support PHP MyAdmin. PHP MyAdmin has become one of the major administrative tools for managing MySQL servers, especially when the servers are located across the LAN or across the WAN. And also it provides a much more user-friendly interface than the terminal monitor interface that we've been using for the past 20 plus hours, 25 plus hours. But nonetheless, you'll find that by understanding the terminal monitor shell interface that you'll be able to translate any SQL commands that are run through a graphical tool rather quickly. In other words, you'll understand it much, much easier. So we'll rerun the RPM query. You'll see Apache is now installed. We'll need to also ensure that we have PHP support. PHP support is required. In other words, the module that's loaded in Apache is required in order to process the PHP pages. So let's return to YAST. We should have specified PHP in the first install, but we'll do it again. That's fine. And the version of PHP that will be installed in our system will be version 5. But there are other versions, other major versions, including 3 and 4. 4 being the more popular version you'll find out in the wild. Let's search for PHP. And here are many modules, many packages for PHP. Version 4 predominates the list of packages. Here's the mod PHP, and if we do a search for mod PHP, you'll see the various versions that show up. 
and PHP 4 seems to be the version that's available but we're going to be downloading PHP 5 to continue our studies of PHP. If we simply want to provide support for Apache, we'd go ahead and get this Apache module that you see here, the Apache 2 mod, and we'll take the PHP 4 package module. This will provide the support that's necessary. And again, there are other PHP packages, such as the pair packages, the session package, which is required to hold session state and other packages that you may or may not need to access different interfaces. We'll go ahead and install the module for Apache as well as the session package in the event that we want to test some PHP related code. But ultimately we'll download the 5.x tree of PHP and overwrite everything that exists on the system. Let's continue. Disk 3 is required which is currently in and now it wants CD number 5 so we'll give it CD 5 and once that's in we should be able to copy these files over and the files are being copied and we should have PHP support in Apache momentarily now that we've set up Apache all that's left for us to do is to extract the PHP my admin bzip file into a location that's web accessible Let's close YAST and proceed. So we downloaded the PHP MyAdmin software to our home directory, but the default web root within the, the SUSE environment is located beneath serve www ht docs. This is the default location. So we'll need to place PHP MyAdmin in that location or modify Apache to serve the content from a different location on the file system. Now we'll need elevated privileges, so let's SU in, and these privileges are required to extract PHP my admin to the desired destination. And we'll simply move PHP my admin into serve www ht docs, and then we'll change into that directory, providing the move was performed successfully. And we'll complete that by running an lsltr. Now we're in this directory, we'll go ahead and execute a tar x jvf to support the extraction of a bzip compressed file. And you'll notice that an entire tree will be created, which is usually prefixed with phpmyadmin dash version number. 2.7 dash pl2 is considered to be the stable release. So this is the top level directory for phpmyadmin, and as it stands, if we were to attempt to hit our Apache instance forward slash PHP my admin we would be presented with either an error or the default page now before we're able to hit it from the browser we do need to make some configuration changes to the default configuration file that PHP my admin uses and that's the config dot default dot PHP file so let's ma modify this particular file we'll pico it this is the file that's read, and there's some directives that we need to update so that the PHP MyAdmin scripts are able to connect to the local instance of MySQL. So the idea is as follows. Let's open a separate shell launch, gedit, and discuss how the logic works. It's very simple. So we'll call this particular section PHP MyAdmin implementation. And we'll also label it as web-based management of my SQL DBMS. So the logic works as follows. Client will connect to Apache web server. Apache will process PHP pages, so process PHP and PHP my admin will directly access the MySQL instance. So PHP MyAdmin will directly access MySQL on the local host. So the client from a web browser connects to Apache. We make a request to a PHP page which gets processed by the PHP module. Version 4 or 5 will suffice for this application. And then PHP MyAdmin which is really represented by the series of PHP files in the PHP MyAdmin version directory will connect to MySQL and function as a broker or perform queries on behalf of the client connected from the web browser. And we've placed PHP MyAdmin into a, a web accessible location. So note, 
replace PHP my admin into a web accessible location. Doesn't have to be in serve www uh, docs. It could be elsewhere. It could be in your user defined directory. But for our intents and purposes, this works. Now the next step is we need to configure the default configuration file with MySQL credentials. In other words, enough credentials to log in to the MySQL DBMS. If you're security conscious, consult the PHP MyAdmin documentation. The documentation instructs you on the, the specific privileges that are to be granted to the user who is going to perform the queries on behalf of the connecting clients. But if you just want to see it work and then worry about the security later, which is generally how most administrators approach systems administration, see it work, proof of concept, then secure it, which isn't necessarily the best way to approach it. You'll want to modify this default config, the default uh, PHP, and save it as a config.inc.php. So this is the file name that will ultimately spit out. So let's mention it here. Configure the default configuration file, which happens to be config.inc.php. That's the file that we'll output. So we'll save the default that we're modifying as the name indicated config.inc.php. And when complete, we'll hit the server, followed by the path to PHP my admin, where there will be a default PHP file to be processed. So what are some of the key directives to make this work? Well, we'll scroll down. The host defaults to the local host. PHP my admin, you should know, can manage remote servers. You may place PHP my admin on one server, let's say your web host, and point it to a different DBMS host somewhere else in your environment or even outside of your environment. The default port is 3306, so we may leave it blank. It may even connect using the default socket. It defaults to TCP, and let's go down and modify the configuration type. Under off type, it uses config, but there are options including config, HTTP, and cookie base. HTTP is considered the more secure of the three but when it's configured using normal clear text HTTP passwords are passed in the clear so let's just note that note default or most secure so default HTTP auth mechanism transports or transmits credentials in clear text, which means if your Apache instance supports SSL, consider accessing PHP MyAdmin using port 443 or the secure sockets layer port instead. So consider using SSL instead. We're going to change from config to HTTP. If you use config, then PHP MyAdmin relies upon the control user and the control password to broker query requests on behalf of the connecting client. So the client will connect, PHP MyAdmin will use the default control user to broker requests. If we go ahead and specify HTTP-based authentication, without SSL, our credentials are passed across the wire, but we will be able to gain access to the database management system, that's MySQL, as the user who's permitted access. So if you connect as a non-privileged user or a user who only has access to one database, you'll only see one database. If you connect as the root user, or in our case, the Linux CBT user, you'll be able to see all databases. Let's switch config to HTTP, and because this particular editor tends to wrap lines, we'll bring them back to one line. And here's the MySQL user, root, which it defaults to, and we'll specify a password of ABC123, used by PHP MyAdmin to connect and broker requests on our behalf. But again, if you connect as a less privileged user, then PHP MyAdmin will only publish databases and tables and columns that you have access to. So don't worry about too much information leaking. Just be sure to turn on SSL on your web server and connect using SSL. So we've configured the few directives and we need to now copy config default.php to config include.php which as we've mentioned in our text file is the default name config.inc.php so let's return and save it as config.inc.php and then we'll confirm that apache is running so that's psax grep i apache and if it isn't running we'll start it let's go ahead and rc apache 2 
There's a start script, by the way, created when using RPMs that are SUSE based. So we'll RC Apache 2 start and we'll debug any errors. This is the first time we're starting Apache, but generally there are no errors. A PSAX grep of Apache reveals that all of its processes are running. It launches using the pre fork mechanism by default. There's a primary process, let's PSAUX. Primary process runs as the root user and subsequent processes run as a non-privileged user called www.run within the SUSE distribution and as another name or other names in other distributions. The www.run user base processes handle web requests while the root process, root Apache process, manages the subsequent or child processes. So you don't need to worry about security. If we execute a netstat NTL you'll see that port 80 is currently bound, which means we can connect to it. However, notice that 443 is not bound, so we'd need to enable SSL support in order for 443 to be available and for us to connect to PHP MyAdmin using SSL. So now, if we go to the browser, we'll simply need to connect to the local host, followed by PHP MyAdmin, followed by version, and this should serve the default page. So let's go to the browser, and in the same page where we connected to the PHP MyAdmin.net homepage, will connect to localhost forward slash. Now before using this directory, let's confirm that Apache responds. This is a positive sign. This tells us that Apache will not list the directory by default and there is no default file that's read from the htdocs directory. So in other words, the error that we're seeing here is being returned by Apache and that's important, which means Apache is up and running and is ready to serve web pages. Now let's try to go into PHP MyAdmin 2.7 and notice it throws an error here config default.php on line 76. Usually this means that the file editor in our case Pico has wrapped a line that it shouldn't have. So let's go ahead and modify it. We'll navigate into PHP my admin and simply Pico config default.php and we'll navigate down towards line 76 and find the error. And notice that this needed has been wrapped, so we'll bring it back to one line and attempt to hit it again. We don't need to restart Apache for the changes to be effected. And notice PHP MyAdmin was unable to read the configuration file, and it says this might happen if it parses it, cannot find the file, and it's looking for config.include.php. The www run user needs to have access to the file, or needs to be able to at least read the file. We've copied config.default.php to config.include.php. So let's take a look at the permissions on the file to ensure that the www user is able to interact with it. And as you can see, the user is able to read it but not make changes to it. So let's take a look at the browser and it's saying it's unable to read the configuration file and it won't be able to parse it and so forth. Now in this case the error is the same error as we just fixed in the default file. So we'll go ahead again and copy config.default.php to config.include.php and that should rectify the problem. But we just want to confirm that the www run user doesn't necessarily need to own the file or to be a member of the group who has access to the file, but it needs to at least be able to read the file. And because the read bit is set, the user is assured to be able to read it, the user in which Apache runs as. Let's return to the browser and refresh and hopefully we'll be successful. And this now says my SQL extension cannot be loaded which leads us to another requirement. There is a plugin that needs to be installed, the MySQL plugin. Let's go to Yast and get it and we'll authenticate because what's happening now is the page is being processed nicely by Apache but PHP MyAdmin relies upon the MySQL plugin to be able to connect to MySQL and that plugin is certainly available so let's go to software management and we'll search momentarily once this pops up after having maximized the window to take full advantage of the 800 by 600 resolution for MySQL and we'll see that there's a module here called PHP4-MySQL. This is a plugin that permits PHP programs like PHP MyAdmin to communicate with the MySQL DBMS. And here's what's required, the shared libraries for version 4.1, which will allow connectivity to version 5. 
This can be installed also if we simply install the shared libraries that ships with version 5 if we have it downloaded in our directory. Let's just take a brief look at our root directory for MySQL and if it isn't here we'll take a brief look at the default directory for Linux CBT and look for MySQL and only the max package exists in the directory. Let's take a brief look again and it's actually an attempt directory and we actually got the shared package so if we were to install the shared package we'd have the shared libraries that are necessary but the PHP support is based on version 4 so we'll just go ahead with yes because again we want to illustrate how PHP my admin works not necessarily how version 5 of PHP works so we'll simply continue and it tells us we'll need CDs 2 as well as 5 so we've inserted disk 2 and now we will insert disk number 5 and the final package will be copied. Now again, we'll be, we've been working on MySQL 5, but SUSE 10 ships with packages that are based on PHP support for version 4 and the client libraries for version 4.1 of MySQL, which works with version 5. Later on, after we've gone through the PHP MyAdmin section, we'll upgrade to the shared package for version 5, as well as the PHP version 5 plugin modules for Apache. Let's go ahead and refresh the connectivity and you'll notice now it's working nicely. We're being prompted for credentials. We'll specify root and root's password. And once we've specified the proper credentials, we're in. On the left, we can select the databases that exist and on the right, there are a world of options for us to explore. So next, we're gonna explore the PHP MyAdmin interface. Once this is out of the way, will provide support for PHP version 5 integration with MySQL and then we'll shift our studies to PHP scripting integration specifically with MySQL version 5.x. Let's continue exploring PHP MyAdmin. So we'll launch a browser again. And again, the default is to connect using clear text or simply HTTP, which means the username and password or credentials are passed across the wire in the clear. We'll connect the localhost followed by the version directory. But if you find that this is a bit cumbersome, what you'll want to do is either create a symbolic link or rename the PHP MyAdmin directory. Now, an error is returned because Apache isn't running, is it isn't set to run by default upon startup and the system has been recently started. So let's go ahead and execute an RC Apache start and this will be up momentarily. And If you want this program to be started every time the system starts use check config followed by the program name and it'll be on in all of the run levels. So check config Apache on will turn it on in all run levels. And it says it's already running. So let's go ahead and hit localhost again. Now again, this URL is a bit long, but it does prompt us for authentication. And what we should show you first and foremost is that if you connect as a non-privileged user, you'll only be able to see databases that the user is able to see. So let's show you how that would work. From the shell, while the pop-up's still there, Let's log into MySQL and we'll authenticate as a super user where we'll then select user host password from MySQL.user. This will give us a sense for the users who are defined on the system and then we can show grants for them. Take for example the user Linux CBT. Let's show grants for this particular user and as you can see the user has all privileges so what we really need is a user who has limited privileges and then to log in as that particular user let's take another user and this particular user doesn't show up unless we specify the full name and this user has 
privileges on all databases. So let's go ahead and grant privileges to a specific database. We'll do so by doing a show databases first, followed by a use, let's say for HR3 to ensure that we have access to it. We'll show tables. And now that we know that the tables exist and are available, let's go ahead and execute a grant all on hr3.star to this new user who can log in from any host. Now let's call the user test PHP and we'll specify that the user is to be identified by a simple password of ABC123. This will create the user. Let's rerun that select query which shows all users. The user is there and then we'll do a show grants for test PHP just to be sure that the user is limited to a single database. So test PHP is able to use the server but only able to interact with one database. Let's go to the browser and attempt to log in as test PHP with a password of ABC123 rather than as the root user. We'll paste this into the username field followed by ABC123 and it logs us in. But the first thing you'll want to notice to the left is that the only two databases that we're able to see includes the information schema which all users can see by default and the HR3 database. So PHP MyAdmin relies solely upon MySQL's permissions and it as a result will not render to the user a database that it's not able to see. So the scripts are essentially under the hood on the Linux box or on your Nix or Windows box sending the, the appropriate queries to the server similar to sending the queries directly from MySQL terminal monitor. This is truly just a PHP front end. So logged in as the user H test PHP we're only able to interact with HR3 as well as the information schema which all users have access to. If you select the database, then you'll see the various tables that are defined in that database. What we're going to do is log in as root where we have more privileges and are able to explore. And we're also going to clean up this long name and make it much easier, more friendly, and more memorable. So we'll close the browser and open a separate shell. And we'll need to SU in to make these changes. So let's do so. Followed by a change into serve www.ht docs. And you'll see that where we extracted PHP MyAdmin, it created a PHP MyAdmin case sensitive dash version directory. This is a bit much for users to memorize unless they bookmark it, of course. If you want to use a generic name such as PHP MyAdmin for easy access to any version of PHP MyAdmin, you have two options. You can create a symbolic link or you can rename the directory of the current version to a simple name. There's yet a third option, such as setting an alias in the Apache configuration file. But let's say you don't have access to the Apache config file. Then you simply rename the directory or force users to memorize the long name or use a symbolic link. Let's go ahead and move PHP MyAdmin to simply PHP MyAdmin lowercase because that's very easy to remember. And a separate shell will launch a gedit to bring our notes up. And towards the bottom, we'll mention that PHP my admin can be made accessible via Apache by doing the following. One, use a symlink to create a user-friendly name that links to the full name. Two, configure an Apache alias. Three, rename the long unfriendly name, which usually looks like the following, PHP. Let's just copy it from the shell. This is the long unfriendly name that users are not likely to memorize. So let's paste this in. So rename the unfriendly name to something simple such as PHP my admin. These are some of your options for making it easy to access. Super. So let's return to the browser and continue exploring PHP my admin. And we'll launch it. Connect to localhost. 
followed by this time PHP my admin. If we attempt to access the old directory, Apache will return an error because there is no such object in the htdocs default directory. However, if we do attempt to access PHP my admin lowercase, it works. And we'll log in as root who has full access. Now, this isn't the root for the Linux operating system. This is the root in the MySQL DBMS. So be sure to use the password that corresponds to the user defined by MySQL and not by the operating system. Now what are some of the features that we need to know about this interface? On the left, first of all it's frames based, so you have a left frame. And on the left frame you'll find across pretty much most if not all versions of PHP MyAdmin, you'll find some key options including how to return to the home page, which is the page where we're currently located. And the home page provides a synopsis of options including variables that we've already run and help documentation character sets and so forth but we'll look at that momentarily here's a link which logs us out this will actually exit if we click on it it kicks us out and prompts us for new credentials and if you fail to provide the credentials PHP my admin returns an error we'll refresh and it prompts us again so let's log back in and logging out basically kills the session and here we're specifying the wrong password. Let's go ahead and kill this and try it again. We've lost our session. And we'll just connect the local host, PHP My Admin. It prompts us. And now we're back in. So the exit logs out. Now, if you recall, we installed a PHP module, which is a session module. Let's RPM query all grep I PHP. And you'll see it momentarily. This particular package, PHP 4-Session, provides session support for PHP applications and scripts that require session support under Apache. So in other words, when we've logged in to PHP MyAdmin, the PHP server running under the auspices of Apache maintains a session for our connection. By clicking on Exit to log out, the session is killed. So it's a web application in that perspective that it maintains a session per user. And sessions are unique per user. So this is what facilitates logging in as the same user from multiple workstations. Root from this desktop and perhaps root from another desktop are two independent sessions. And that support is provided by the PHP 4-session package. Notice also that the version of PHP 4 that ships with the SUSE 10 operating system is considered one of the later 4 series, 4.4. .4. However, the newest or latest series available is 5.1, which we'll be looking at momentarily. So the session package allows us to create a session. Additionally, there's a query window. This query window is similar to any query analyzer that you've used, including the MySQL terminal monitor from the shell, as well as the query analyzer that we installed on the Windows system. When you click on it, it pops up a window, and this window allows us to do quite a few things. The default tab is the SQL tab. If we go ahead and execute a query such as show databases, followed by, of course, the semicolon termination which is required, then click on Go, you'll see that the query, query's output will be displayed on the main page. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's navigate to the background, and here's the output. The databases are listed, and they're provided with links. If you were to click on any one of them, and if you hover over them, you'll see it tells you which database you're currently on. So let's click on that query window again. The last query that was run remains, and you can go ahead and execute any query that's understood by the MySQL server in the query window. So this is a query analyzer window which allows you to dump queries, which means if you have queries sitting on the file system in a text file, you can literally copy them, paste them into the query window and have them run. And we've run so many queries that we've stored in our text file. Let's go ahead and find a select, for example, that we can take. And here's a simple select user, which will tell you who you're currently logged in as. So we'll pop this up and replace it and simply click on go and then navigate to the main page where you'll see that the output for select user is shown. So we're logged in as root at localhost. So we can take any query that we've defined. Let's keep looking for additional queries where we've performed more work such as joins and simply dump them. 
but some of this information may not exist, so we'll simply ignore it. But again, you get the point. You dump your SQL queries here, click Go, and the output is dumped to the main PHP MyAdmin page. Let's return to the pop-up window. You may also import files. This is the function provided by MySQL import or load data in file. If you have a file which is parsable, you may import it directly into a table. Or if you have a query, a file with queries defined in them, you may import them. So for example, let's go ahead, so this is actually for queries. Let's go ahead and define a query file in our home directory. We'll use the Pico editor and we'll simply say select star from hr3.employees. Simple query. We'll save it and we'll call this employees.sql. So that's a query file. Very simple. Let's browse for it and we'll search our home directory. Here it is, employees.sql. And once we've gotten the file, we'll click on go to have it uploaded to the server. And there's a query. Select star from hr3.employees. Now obviously there are no rows. There are no employees defined in hr3. Let's execute the same query from within the terminal monitor. Select star from hr3.employees and there is one particular user defined. So let's go back to the interface to find the user. And it says showing rows 0 so obviously there's something in fact it, re it did re return the, the output so what was returned here is how long it took. But here it is. Here's the one row. So there's one row that was returned and we have the ability once the row is returned to make changes to the row. We can edit. We may also execute a bookmarked query. We may also delete this particular row by clicking on delete. When you click on delete and notice it says do you really want to and it shows you the SQL statement that will be executed. We'll cancel obviously and so on. Let's go back to the query window. So again this browse button is for importing queries directly into the query window, the SQL query window. There's also a SQL history tab which will show you your history of queries after you've stored your history or your queries. So after you've run multiple queries, the SQL history query or the SQL history tab will show you that history, which is similar to navigating through the queries that have been run using up or down arrows within the MySQL terminal monitor. So these are some of the characteristics of this pop-up box. The most important feature is the ability to execute SQL queries and to import SQL queries to have them run directly on the server. You may also specify the character set of the file since MySQL supports so many character sets depending on how your file is saved you may want to indicate as such before committing by clicking on go to have the file imported. Great. So on the left you have a few key icons. Here's a question mark icon which launches documentation in a separate window. The PHP MyAdmin versions always come with documentation and it's usually one large HTML file that you can browse to learn about the key directives and how to configure authentication and so on. This is the main file the main document, documentation for PHP MyAdmin. It's accessible from the question mark. And here's yet another link for SQL documentation. You pop this up, it takes you to dev.mysql.com where you may research SQL commands that are runnable or executable within MySQL version 5. So this points to dev MySQL. This points to local PHP MyAdmin documentation, which shows you how to configure authentication as well as what are the key variables and what can be tuned within PHP MyAdmin's configuration file. There's a query window which allows us to import queries or just to type them out and have them run. For example, we could execute a show process list, which we've done time and time again, and the output's dumped to the screen. Here are the processes that are running. We still have replication configured and two root connections one from the MySQL terminal monitor and in another from the PHP MyAdmin interface. So next we're going to continue exploring PHP MyAdmin and its useful features. So let's continue exploring PHP MyAdmin. So you know that you can execute any query by clicking on the SQL query window 
anything you want. You can even execute multiple queries no differently than you would within a MySQL terminal monitor window. So for example, show process lists as well as select star from, or perhaps we'll get the individual columns. So we'll select user host password from mysql.user, another common query for us. We'll click on go. Now these are two queries separated by semicolons and notice that the output is presented to us nicely. First the process list and then the user. So both have executed as separate queries. Super. So what are other features we may want to know about? In a databases drop down if you're logged in as a user who has all privileges or at least the read privilege or select privilege to all databases you will see a list of all of the databases on the server. By clicking on any of the databases you will be drilling down by default into that database which will reveal properties of the database which includes of course tables and you may further drill down into the hierarchy beneath the table level down to the column level and set attributes, extend tables, alter tables and any typical SQL administrative function that you'd normally perform using a GUI or shell based tool can for the most part be performed using phpMyAdmin and if you don't see a graphical way to do it if you know the query simply launch the query window and execute the query so if there's something that you don't see within the interface but you do know the query to, to effect the change then simply execute the query in the query window or of course execute the query from the terminal monitor window either or will work so again selecting any database will take you to the database Selecting databases does nothing unless you're already in a database. So if you're in contact, for example, you see the properties of contacts, which by default shows you the tables within contact. Also notice that next to each database is a number, a numeric value. That value corresponds to the number of tables defined within the database. So the contact database consists of four separate tables, character one, numeric one, people, and people two. HR consists of simply one, but this particular database has an error because it was originally set up as an NODB database, so it no longer exists because we got rid of the file. HR2 consists of no tables. This particular database can be dropped, and notice the drop feature is up here, and it's labeled in red. If we attempt to drop it, it gives an error because it doesn't see an HR2 directory in var MySQL or var live MySQL. So what happens when you execute a drop is that it attempts to remove from var live MySQL the name of the directory. And as you can see, HR2 exists and it contains one text file, but within HR2 are no table files and no DB option files. So it throws an error. If you simply went ahead and removed HR2 since it contains no useful information, and refresh the interface. Let's go ahead and refresh it. Then take a look at the databases list. You'll notice that HR2 is now gone, so we don't have to worry about dropping it manually. Ditto for any other database that we drill down on. Simply clicking on the database will drill down on the database, and just hovering over it, you'll see the number of tables. So, for example, a default factory ship of MySQL's default database includes 18 tables. HR3 that we've defined contains three tables, very simple. And the tables are listed to the right in the main window as well as in the left frame beneath the database in a hierarchical fashion. Here are the three tables. And by, of course, clicking on any of the tables, you drill down on the properties of the tables. Additionally, when you hover over each of the table, each of the tables, you'll notice that it tells you the type of table. It's in ODB for clients employees as well as pay scale and it also returns the size of the table on the file system as well as the number of rows so as you can see employees consists of one row that's what we've, we've inserted let's go ahead and insert a new value into the row using the familiar terminal monitor interface we'll insert into employees and we'll just simply set f name to be equivalent to the following followed by l name to be equivalent to the following followed by pay scale id which we're, we are currently not cross-referencing in the pay scale table 
but we can place a value in it just for storage and then cross-reference it at another point once we define or redefine the values for pay scale. So now we have two users in the pay in the employees table with pay scale IDs. Let's return to the interface. Now we haven't refreshed the interface, so it still shows at last scan or at last run of the PHP page that it contains one row. If you refresh the browser and then navigate to the database HR3 and then hover over employees you'll see that it consists of two rows so you do need to refresh the page because the web is or the web based environment is stateless unless you're using some other protocol such as Java or Ajax or some other dynamic pro protocol JavaScript etc that will constantly check on a recurring basis if you don't, then the information's static. Once it's loaded in the browser, it's loaded and needs to be refreshed manually by the user. But it's similar within the terminal monitor environment as well, because here you see a static output of one row, and unless we rerun the query, we won't know that there are two users defined in the employees table. So here are the tables, and again, once you drill in a database, you see over to the right all sorts of useful features, all sorts of things that you can do with the tables and the structure of the database and so forth. If you want to analyze the structure of the database, click on Structure. Structure is the default tab, and what you see here represents the structure. The structure includes the name of the table, its actions that may be performed or the various actions that you can perform on the table such as browsing data notice that the tables that contain no data for the browse icon are dimmed so we can't actually browse tables that contain no data in other words we can't do a select star from those tables because they contain no data however the employees table turns into a pointer or into a hand and is not dimmed because it consists of two rows but you know that because in the records column you see the number of records per table. There are only two records in the employees table and zero records in clients and pay scale for a total of three tables and a sum of two records across the board. So if you want to drill down click on the browse icon and when you browse it executes a query that you may commit to memory and use it at some point and here are the two records that were returned so here's what was run select star if you want you can explain the sequel there's a link that will explain actually what was what was happening when it ran how it executed the query this tells you the execution path and if you click on as we have just done skip explain then it returns simply to the query and so an explain SQL query will actually show you the path that was taken to return the results. In this case, no indices were consulted. We simply went to the table. So we'll skip the excl explanation. Notice there's a neat link here to create PHP code. Let's click on it to show you what's outputted. If you wanted to perform this same SQL query in PHP, PHP MyAdmin is a great tool to learn the syntax of PHP. In PHP, you would define a variable called SQL. Well, this is the suggested way of doing it. You could define a variable using any name that's familiar or comfortable or ideal for your application. But in this case, the suggested variable is called SQL, equal to the entire query in between single quotes, which happens to be a select star from employees, limit 0, 30. Well, in this case, we don't have more than two rows, so the limit function will work. And it's actually optional. You don't need this but it speeds up queries if you specify a limit of course so here's the PHP code you can literally copy this and paste it into a text file or into your favorite PHP or scripting language editor and be productive rather quickly this will be your variable and of course there are other prerequisites such as creating a database connection from the PHP code to be able to run such a query and of course outputting the results which we look at once we cover the PHP my admin section so let's return to the browser and we can return to without PHP code we can also refresh the query because data is subject to change so clicking on refresh will always return how long the query took what was returned two records were returned and it took n number of seconds no differently than within the MySQL terminal monitor the number of rows the number of seconds the precision just happens to be greater when using PHP MyAdmin but that can be adjusted of course 
And here you may adjust the number of rows that you show. For example, show me two rows. And this adjusts, of course, the limit to 0, 2, and will only show two rows. Here we may specify in horizontal, rotated headers, vertical, for example. Click on Go to update the query, and watch the output change in the way it's reported. And here are the records. We're free again yet to execute deletes, to drop, and so forth. And providing you have access, it will kill anything that's here. Now we did insert data from the terminal monitor interface. How about inserting from the PHP My Admin interface? Simply, simply click on Insert a New Row after you've outputted your results. Since we're operating on the Employees table, and here are the fields that constitute the Employees table and the functions and values that we can tie to the table. If there are functions that you'd like to call, you can do so, and they will store that value when called. So for example, if there's a column that should calculate the date time as we've shown you, you may select date time. Or if you want it to do a password hash, or current time, or current date, or from days, or anything you want, count, sum, average, you may define columns that are auto-calculated by specifying a function. Otherwise, you'll specify the values in the value column. So we can go ahead and insert those new values. And once we've done so, you just simply click on Go, and the information will be inserted for you. So let's go ahead and insert a new user. And we'll specify that this is the first name followed by last name and a pay scale ID of 20 and we've hit the fields that should be specified. The auto-incremented field will take care of itself. It will be inserted as a new row. We'll click on Go. Here is the query, Insert Into Employees, similar to what we've been specifying, but this is a longer query. We simply use the set variety rather than specifying the individual columns followed by the values. But nonetheless, here's an optional way of performing the insert. You describe the columns, all of the columns, and all of the values. So for ID, for example, a null is sent, or you could optionally send default, which would default to null, causing the ID column to auto-increment. Either or would work. Or you just simply specify the columns that you're inserting, such as F name, L name, and pay scale ID, and let the DBMS handle it for you. So here's the query, insert into, click on go, and once you've done so, a result is outputted, it tells you the number of rows that were inserted then you can return to browse to browse the output. Now we inserted twice by virtue of inserting once and then inserting again we inadvertently insert it twice so we can go ahead and drop the redundant record by clicking on delete which executes a delete, delete from employees where ID is equal to 4. It's basing it on ID because ID is unique whereas F name, L name and pay scale ID columns are not unique so it's good to perform deletes on unique columns. We'll click OK and the screen will be refreshed and now you'll see only three records which is exactly what we wanted. So you can perform inserts by clicking on insert new row, define the values for your fields, and here's a section that tells you which fields if you want to ignore. You can ignore certain fields or just insert data into all of your fields. The ignore will then just set the fields that you intend to insert into. So that works as well. Suppose we wanted to ignore F name and just focus on the other columns. We certainly can by checking and unchecking those particular columns. So browse returns the results of the records that are stored. So it returns a result set. In this case we have three records. The structure will allow you to interface to the structure of the table. The first or the initial display shows you the column names or the field names followed by the types that we defined, the collation which are defaults, the Latin one Swedish, any particular attributes on a per column basis which we have set none, whether or not nulls are accepted, default and so forth. Now if you notice this particular output looks strikingly similar to a describe command that can be run against the table. Let's go ahead and execute describe against employees and compare and contrast the output. Notice the output is identical. Field name, field type, whether or not nulls are accepted, any key information, default values, and extra. 
phpMyAdmin just goes a step further to show us also collation attributes whether or not nulls are permitted which is the same the extra information auto increment and it provides the action column which allows us to do things such as browse change and this is the ID field if you go ahead and browse it for example it returns just the ID field the query is written just to return the ID column so you may even browse on a column basis or a columnar basis so let's say we want to browse just first names click on browse for first names and only first names are returned which is the equivalent of saying select first name in this case the query is performing a count which is returned as well in the output but what's returned really is just for our usage our main usage or primary usage is the first name column so you can create a query by simply clicking on at the columnar level the browse icon which will output information just for that particular column and this is in the structural view you may also edit a given column so let's say we want to change first name well if you try to change it from what it is to something else then you certainly can by selecting a new type notice var cars are default with a length of 20 and there's some other options here or other notes here it tells you and some warnings regarding using values that won't fit your data type that's stored but you can switch to any data type now this is a great way if you don't memorize the data types or if you have trouble memorizing the data type supported by MySQL it's great to use graphical tools such as the query analyzer because they store them for you here are all of the data types many of which we've discussed so we may go from var car let's say to car or change var car 20 to let's say something else which effectively will execute an alter table statement so next we're going to continue exploring PHP my admin so we're still focusing on PHP my admin its usefulness as a graphical web-based means of administering your MySQL implementation not to mention a byproduct of using PHP my admin is the fact that it'll teach you both MySQL which supports standard SQL as well as PHP code so let's list that as a plus note byproduct of using PHP my admin is that it will teach you SQL and PHP code especially if your intent is to focus on integrating PHP with MySQL you can use it to write queries for you and to learn how queries should be written and how to optimize queries and so forth so again we mentioned we wanted to go ahead and effect an alter table statement which will alter this column changing it from varcar 20 let's say to varcar 30 the collation remains the same but notice that there is a wide variety of collations that are supported so you are free to use any of the collations depending on your region and your preferences let's scroll over if there needs to be any attributes set such as whether it's unsigned unsigned zero fill such as with auto incremented columns that should never be negative you may set them or if it should be updated on current timestamp that may also be set which we've shown you using the date time or the timestamp field type that is nulls not nulls what the default value is and any extras extras usually include auto increment well this is a varcar column so none of those apply but we do want to extend the column to be varcar 30 versus varcar 20 we'll go ahead and save and notice what's executed is an alter table statement which is what you expected which we've of course covered so again you're learning SQL by using PHP my admin alter table employees with the change function followed by the name of the column and it's going to be changed or was changed from to first name varcar 30 and the character set was specified in the query as well which is not required since MySQL will use whatever defaults are defined for the column now what's of interesting note is that MySQL supports per columnar collation sets and character sets so you may collate and define character sets on a per columnar basis so first name may be based on Latin 1 Swedish for example and last name may be based on a Spanish or some other type of collation as well as character set so that's pretty flexible that 
on a per columnar basis as well as on a per table as well as on a per database basis you may specify all this information so again wherever you see browse know that it'll execute a query for you a select query clicking on browse to show us first name will simply select first name as well as uh, with account and return just the first name information that's pretty obvious let's go back and of course we have to click OK because when you click on the browse icon it posts to an action script the select query to be executed in the background to return the results to us and again you know that you can edit columns here's an ID column which is auto incrementing and again we can specify that we want to increase it let's say from int to big int it's still of type integer so it shouldn't be a problem to execute an alter statement we can specify the collation any attributes such as whether it's unsigned usually auto incremented columns are unsigned since they are always positive whether or not nulls are permitted and what the default is the default usually is null because not nulls is or nulls are not permitted that is and the extra column contains auto incremented so let's go ahead and click save and take a brief look at the alter table statement simply changed ID to big int so it's now of type big int also notice that the table that we're operating in is occupying about four megabytes of space from the InnoDB file if you recall InnoDB by default stores its information in a default IB data file don't forget that because InnoDB is a popular storage engine you need to know where your data is so unless you have other InnoDB directives defined the four megabytes that's currently being referenced on the page represents four megabytes out of the ten megabytes in the IB data one file so just keep that in mind as well so you can browse on a per columnar basis you can check multiple columns let's take first name last name pay scale then go over to browse for one of them and you'll see what happens it picks only the one column rather than picking all of the columns to browse so that's something else to keep in mind when you select multiple columns you can perform other functions such as deleting dropping the entire row set that you have selected let's go back to structure and here's a structure with the action section and again if you were to check all of the options here then you can affect changes below like in this section below here such as adding new columns deleting creating indices this section here will allow you to create an index there is an index defined on the primary key which is the ID field you can drop it edit it you'll see the space that's in use for the index since it's in ODB that's, this means that 16k out of the IB data one file is in use for storing the index on the column which only contains or on this particular table which only contains currently three records the next auto index is four this is great to know tells you when it was created this particular table the format and its collation all useful information and again if you want to affect changes to the selected columns you may select them such as first name last name pay scale but don't click on browse in the action section to the right because this is going to affect per columnar or be applicable to the column rather than to the selected columns so these are for selecting individual columns and on the left below you may click on browse to browse all columns as an example now we've clicked on browse and notice that it selected first name last name and pay scale ID and return those three columns to us so let's go to structure again to take a brief look at that if you're interested in specific columns select them first name last name and then choose the option from below which basically will include all of the selected columns remember it's a web application so we're relegated to simple tools for selecting options such as check boxes radio buttons and so on now another database that we quite frequently have used to query information is the MySQL database let's take a brief look at it here are the 18 tables we'll take a look at the user table which is the global permissions table and perform a query selecting host user let's also get password and the rest are primarily privileges and then we'll click on browse to get those columns from the table so we've selected host user password from user no differently than we've done in the shell and here it is we have those three columns host user password 
host was selected first of course you may move them around full text them and so forth but here are the columns as they would be displayed in the MySQL interface so structure allows you to not only change the structure let's go back to a simple database not only allows you to change the structure it allows you to perform queries to browse the data for a given column to delete the column to know how many records are in the table PHP my admin presents a lot of information up front now obviously it's ideal to have higher resolution we're operating at 8 by 6 here if you're at 1024 or even higher preferably you'll see the remainder of the information but all the information that's presented here is quite useful and saves a lot of time from running queries in the terminal monitor the advantage of course of the terminal monitor is that if you're proficient at SQL commands supported by MySQL then you can be more productive more or be more more productive much quicker if you are familiar with SQL commands supported by MySQL otherwise phpMyAdmin provides a great graphical way of learning it and again you know the type for each type of table because within a given DB you may have tables of type MyISAM as well as InnoDB you may also create tables that's certainly something you can do here's a create new table on the database HR3 let's go ahead and create a new table we'll create a simple table we'll call it vacations and vacations will have basically a field which will store a date value and also a field for the user's ID so we want two columns user ID as well as the date that the user ID is going to take the vacation very simple once we've clicked on go now we have the ability to define those two fields so let's go ahead and define an employee ID and it should be of type big int to match the type for the employee ID defined in the employees table the length of the values will be specified for us the default collation works well and it should not be null and it's not going to be auto incremented so we will avoid all of those options the next column is simply a date type column so we'll call it vacation date now, in fact we could make this three columns to include a vacation start date and vacation end date but we'll just go ahead and call it vacation date and make it date length values will go with the default we'll ignore everything else but it should not be null which is the default now notice what we're trying to illustrate here is that you can create within a given DB tables of different types notice the default type is my ISAM you know where this comes from if you run a show engines either from the query browser here or from the MySQL terminal monitor this should come as no surprise we've been looking at this output for hours now so let's rerun that so it fits within the window my ISAM shows up as the default so the PHP my admin scripts are basing its information on whatever is set to be the default so it's going to set the table type to be my ISAM by default but here are the other table types that are supported it knows it because the output comes from show engines so we'll make it my ISAM the collation will default to Swedish Latin 1 Swedish and that's it so we want to go ahead now we have the ability here or to add another field let's say we wanted to stretch this out a bit to make it vacation start date as well as vacation end date if you go ahead and add that extra field now you have vacation start as well as vacation end let's change start to end and now we have the additional fields and we'll make this of type date as well and once we're ready to save this table information based on my ISAM we click on save if there are any errors with the options that we've selected PHP my admin will complain otherwise it shows you the query that was executed which is basically a create table query which we're familiar with and it explicitly specified a type of my ISAM to avoid any confusion but of course as we know the default table type is my ISAM so that's what will be created also notice on the left in the database section because the page was refreshed both left and right panes were refreshed the HR3 database has been updated to reflect four tables rather than three which now includes a vacations table vacations table will 
store employee ID, vacation start date, and vacation end date. And perhaps we could build a tiny interface to allow the HR person to insert the applicable values. Super. Now let's confirm that this particular table is actually on the file system. So from the shell, well, LSLTR, there's the HR3 directory. We'll navigate into HR3, and you'll find momentarily that we have vacations index, vacations data file, or table data file that currently has no data, and the vacations form file, which describes the structure of the vacations table. So it's been created. Also, notice from our earlier work, table based in ODB files. These are no longer in use, by the way, and we know as such because, for example, the current date is the 25th, but we've recently updated our data to reflect new data on the 25th, and it's not reflected by these two files, which tells us that the 10 megabyte IB Data 1 file, or the shared IB Data table file, is being used. So we have our new table structure, and the HR database now consists of mixed table types. Let's click on databases, then go to HR3, and you'll see the mixed types in ODB, in ODB, in ODB, followed by my ISAM. And then there's a sum that's calculated, which is based on my ISAM to return information to us, such as four tables. This is all created on the fly by PHP My Admin, nothing permanent that's stored within the database. There's so much you can do with this tool. If you're within a table structure, for example, you may want to query it. You may want to search it. You may also want to execute SQL commands. Click on SQL. You can run it directly. Click on Query. You pick the fields that you want. Define your criteria on the fly. And then a query statement will be built. You may also export the data to one of the types supported. You may pick the tables that are of interest from the current database, client, employees, pay scale, or vacations, and you may output or export the data to one of the following types XML, CSV, CSV that works best with Microsoft's Excel, Excel 2K, Word 2K, LaTeX, and SQL. When you select each option, notice the right changes. There's a little JavaScript in, to enable all this. SQL is a default. If you export information, it's similar to executing a MySQL dump from the command line. The SQL that, that can be used to recreate the table structure and its data will be outputted to a text file. And you may add options such as if not exists so that your text file, your SQL file that's created will have or contain a create table statement that says if not exists. You may also add a drop table so if it ex even if it does exist, drop it anyway. So you may output to a SQL friendly format which includes the data and you may also even omit adding the data. When you're done, you simply you define a file name. When you're done, you click on Go, and PHP My Admin will output the information to a file for you. But again, you may output just the structure, similar to using MySQL dump with the D option telling it to not output data, but to simply output the structure. If you recall, MySQL dump, and we'll run it with help and pipe its output to less, you'll see momentarily that the D option, once we find it, will output the structure but no data. It's, an, it's a very important feature. It's very useful, that is. Let's find that option. And it should be somewhere towards the bottom. And there it is, the D option. So when using MySQL dump, you may dump your table structure similar to the way PHP My Admin allows you to output information without the structure or without the actual data. So you may send the structure but no data. Notice it says data here. Simply take off the data option and what will be outputted is the structure. And again, you can pick any of these formats such as Excel or perhaps CSV for Excel whether or not you want to put the field names in the first row so that when Excel imports it, it is able to tell what the field names are. Or simply CSV, and you may specify how to terminate your fields, with of course the default being semicolon and enclosing the fields using quotes. 
but this is all optional and can be influenced. Now this is on a per table basis. You may also dump full databases. You can export the entire database, not just the table structure. But when you're within the context of a table, the export options are context specific. Now you know your context because if you notice up top, you see information related to the server that you're connected to. This is the highest object in the hierarchy, the server connected to local hosts, followed by the database, HR3. And this is the context information, so server, then database, and then tables. If you go back to server local hosts, it returns you to the main menu, where you can still export information. Simply navigate towards the bottom to export, and now you have the ability to export full databases. But you may also select all. Maybe you wanted to dump all databases to a large SQL file. Maybe your databases aren't large, and if you dump them, it won't take up too much space. You may even want to compress the output, and then transport the information to a remote system for import, or just for backup. As mentioned, if you save it to a file and you click on Go, what will happen is a pop-up, and you may store it to a SQL file, which is the default. But again, you can compress this information if you want. That's certainly an option. You may select all databases, or you may select a single database, such as HR3. But the type that will be outputted for default is of type SQL, or SQL statements that are pretty much compatible with any SQL compliant DBMS engine. And again, you can give it any name you want. It says use DB for database name. Well, we're outputting a DB or table name, use table. If you go ahead and click go to tell it to output it to a file, let's save it to disk. It'll save it to a file. And we can check our home directory here. Let's go to Linux CBT's home directory to see where it placed this file. And there it is, localhost.sql. Let's take a brief look at this file, localhost.sql. That's a def default name, that is. And here's the SQL that was outputted. It'll create a database called HR3. It'll create a table clients. It'll create a table called employees and pay scale and vacations with the proper structure. Let's go back to our information here. So these options are definitely available. You may specify how the data is actually exported for import as well. And we didn't include any if not exists or drop statements, so they're not included. But the auto increment is included if, it's, if it was a part of the original definition. Here are different SQL engines that you can specify for compatibility, because there are certain nuances across the different SQL engines that PHP MyAdmin knows about. So if you're concerned about compatibility between the two engines, let's say you're going from MySQL to Oracle, click on Oracle, and PHP MyAdmin will use its logic to be sure that none of the statements will be a problem for Oracle to handle for the most part. But of course, sometimes bugs occur. So we're still focusing on PHP MyAdmin. It's a powerful tool. We literally can spend many hours covering it because it can do so much and it's been well programmed by the team at phpmyadmin.net. And again, you simply make this tool available in a web accessible location. Configure a user who has access to the MySQL user and other tables that are necessary and this tool will serve your user community well. Now we've granted access to the root user for simplicity just to illustrate how easy it is to configure but certainly you can restrict access to only the rights that are required and that information is included with the documentation with the product. Let's take a brief look at the documentation. You'll see that there are some grant statements below regarding setting up the user who performs the account validation and connectivity and other functions that are required. By copying this full grant statement that you see here, or these multiple grant statements, and you could select a different user other than PMA for PHP MyAdmin, you could then reconfigure the default file to use these privileges. So for example, let's copy this particular statement, paste it into our text file, 
and we'll paste it into a separate file so it doesn't mess up our current file. Now let's say we want to identify this user by ABC123 and PMA is the user that we'll go with. Notice what the grant statement does is it grants select on certain columns. Now we haven't gone through granting on a column or a per column basis. We've only shown you how to affect permissions on a table basis as well as database basis. But you can do it at the column level as well. This grant select restricts select privileges to only certain columns from mysql.user to the user PMA at localhost. It grants select on mysql.db, select on mysql.host. This is the full DB table as well as the full host table. It also grants to these particular columns from the privilege table. So if we went ahead and executed this command and reconfigured PHP MyAdmin, it would work and this would increase security dramatically rather than providing unnecessary privileges. We can do it even from within PHP MyAdmin because PHP MyAdmin still is connected as the root user and we're logged in as the root user so it would work as well. Simply launch the query window, paste the query either here or into MySQL terminal monitor or into the query analyzer or some tool that will allow you to submit queries to the MySQL server. Click on go and then the query will execute and if it had problems executing you'll notice that it would say unsuccessful but in this case it was successful. A simple show grants will show us whether or not the user exists and the privileges so if we did a show grants for PMA at localhost from our terminal monitor let's go ahead and do that. Show grants for PMA at localhost you'll see that PMA at localhost is granted all the privileges such as general usage which all anonymous accounts are granted by default as well as select and select on certain columns and select on certain tables to determine privilege information. PMA has been set up but we haven't configured PMA for PHP MyAdmin. You'd simply modify the default configuration file located in the serve www direction. Again, this is SUSE specific. For your distribution, the default web root may be somewhere else. But for SUSE, it's in serve www. For Red Hat, it's in var www. So, for example, if we modified the config.include.php and modified the root user who's currently logged in or who brokers the connection root abc123 to pma and abc123, then this configuration would work. Let's go ahead and set this particular user to be pma and PMA again is a, a non-privileged or less privileged user. And once done, we'll copy this file, config.include.php to config.default, which is the real file that's read. So we've copied it to config.default.php. And to ensure that all the changes have taken effect, we should close the browser windows and reconnect. Closing the browser windows will kill all of the sessions. And let's reconnect using localhost PHP MyAdmin and if it prompts us then we know that our configuration is still correct. Let's log in as root so that we have full privileges to the server and we're back in but now PHP MyAdmin is using the PMA account to connect. So let's continue our exploration of this interface. So as we've mentioned you can drill down on a per database basis and affect changes to tables and columns. But there are also some global options which can be examined and changed and interacted with from the main page. The main page is accessible by clicking on the house, the icon with the house. You'll see some cool things that you can do such as creating a new database. Let's say we want to create a new database and call it HR4. We may select the collation if the default doesn't suffice, but we'll go with the default because it suffices for Western Europe and the United States and here's the syntax that was used to create the database. Immediately after creating a new database you're presented with the ability to create fields and tab tables. So we can create a table name with n number of fields. At this stage it isn't required because you know it's easy to do but it is possible. You may also set privileges on this particular database. Here are the privileges for the system. You may grant additional privileges. But let's go back to the home menu and talk some more about what we can do. So you know you can create a database. It's very simple. You may set the collation. 
You may even change the language that PHP My Admin is currently operating in from English to whatever else and the character set may be changed, the collation, the default connection collation may be changed. You may even change the theme to the one that's included. This is the dark blue orange or download a theme from the web and change the look and feel. And again documentation, the home page, what's changed in the product, CVS, lists to learn more information about PHP My Admin. But back to some of the options that apply on a global basis. When you're at the default home page it tells you what version you're running it tells you the version of the MySQL server that we're connected to. If you recall, to support replication and other features, such as other storage engines, we had to enable MySQL Max by installing the Max package. So it tells us that we're running the Max version, which supports increased functionality. Runtime information, this is a show command. You click on it, and it returns critical information such as how much data received and sent, the total thus far since it's been up and running. It also tells you how long the server has been up. It's been running for two hours, one minute and 37 seconds. It tells you when the server came up. It was brought up this morning. And here are all the other categories, InnoDB, so forth, etc. Connections. This is all information based on the show commands that we've already shown you that you can run from MySQL Terminal Monitor. Here's a section specific to InnoDB and other specific sections that may or may not be of value to you. But that information is revealed from the home page by simply clicking on Show MySQL Runtime Information. If you want to see what variables are defined, click on Show System Variables. Auto Increment, Auto Commit, all of these options are returned by going to this particular section. There are too many to cover at this particular stage and you'll tune them or tweak them over time. Show processes is obvious. It's a show process list command which returns a number of users who are connected to the server. Let's go back by clicking on home. Character sets and collations that are supported. These are the different character sets and collations. There are so many. As you know MySQL is quite capable the storage engines, self-explanatory yet again. These are the different types supported. And you know, InnoDB is provided by default. We looked at federated and so on. ISAM and NDB cluster are disabled. You may reload MySQL. This flushes the privileges. In the event that you change privileges and you notice that they're not taking effect by clicking on reload MySQL, it executes a flush privileges command, which you could execute from MySQL Terminal Monitor. Any query you could execute from PHP MyAdmin can be executed from MySQL Terminal Monitor. So if for some reason you notice that your privileges are not being updated, you want to click on Reload MySQL. Here you have access to the binary log. Click on this, Show Bin Log Events. If there are any events, it will be displayed. This is returned directly from the bin log file. It tells you the name of the current log file, the position, as you know that's important for replication, and what's occurred. Let's go back. But again, this can be all revealed from the shell. Databases. Obvious. You click on this, you see a list of databases. Their collations, the number of tables, rows, including size information. Here's the data, the number of indexes, or the indexes in size, the total, and the overhead. All critical information. Then it's all summed at the bottom anyway. So if you want to know what's happening with all of your databases, this tells us that there are eight databases, including the default MySQL and information schema sch schemas and you get a summation of the sizes occupied by all databases across the entire system. Very important information. Let's go back. Scroll down. You can export at a database level. You may import at a database level. If you have a file which contains SQL commands, simply browse for it. Scan your local file system, such as employees.sql execute it and the commands are executed. They need to be of course SQL commands. We're not importing here data into a particular table but rather importing a SQL file to be executed on the server. Let's return to the home page. You may change the password of the currently logged in user. Again this is self-explanatory. Various password hashing mechanisms have been supported over the course of MySQL's existence. 
the format that we're using is compatible with 4.1, which represented a major change since 4.0, and is supported by 5.0 and higher. So if you change your password, you want to use the hashing that's based on 4.1 if your backend server is based on 4.1 and higher. Our server is 5.018, so we'd want to use 4.1. Again, changing password affects the current user. But of course, you can manage passwords for users on the system by drilling down to the privileges section, which we purposely skipped. So let's click on privileges to see what we can actually do on a per user basis. First and foremost, you see users from A through Z, and only for the letters where you do have users will you see a hyperlink. So for example, we have hyperlinks for LPR as well as T, and that tells us that we have users with those first characters in their names. Here are all the users. We may check them all and perform changes against all of them, global changes, such as deleting all of them, or revoking privileges, or deleting them, and then re reloading the privileges, or dropping databases that the users that the users actually have access to. So we can do certain things on a global basis for all the users, or we may make changes on a per user basis. So for example, let's take any of the user accounts. We have two accounts here, one for any host, one for local host. And if we wanted, we can edit privileges. This user has all privileges, which is considered to be quite a bit. Click on edit, and what you see is a nice layout of privileges that are assigned for the data, as well as for the structure, as well as for administration and resource limits. But we've been through all of this. We've told you that you can apply these changes for data structure as well as administration. Just to quickly recap, the data related permissions are related to the DDL statements that, or the DML statements that you can execute, such as select, insert, update, delete, and file. These are DML or data manipulation language statements. The structural permissions are DDL statements, create, alter, and so forth. Routines, functions, temporary tables, drop, index. These are DDL statements. Administration statements, including grant, whether or not the user can replicate, they can show databases. This is actually a privilege that can be granted. The PHP MyAdmin interface serves as a great way to quickly reference the permissions that are supported in the various contexts, including DML, DDL, as well as administrative type permissions. These are the permissions that can be granted for the different tiers of access. So you don't need to memorize these permissions. Simply use a tool such as PHP MyAdmin or MySQL's query utility, and you will know the permissions that are supported. In addition, we can set resource limits, which we've mentioned, queries per hour, updates per hour, connections per hour, and max number of user connections from a given user. We may add privileges, custom privileges. We may change passwords for a specific user by highlighting the user and changing their password and so forth. So there are different form fields to allow you to do these things. You may even generate a password. So you can type in a value, generate the hash, and update it. So this information relates to this particular user. You can change the user's password, or you may generate a string, a long string, for a tough password and make this the user's password. But it won't be reflected as a string that you see here. It'll be hashed and stored as a different value. So let's say we want to copy this. The copy function pastes it using JavaScript into both fields, and then this will update the user's password. Now the user's password at localhost has been updated, so if we look at the users by navigating to privileges, and if we wanted, if we wanted to browse the user, we'd see that the user currently has a much, much tougher password. We can also do so by going to MySQL, and then looking at the user table, that is. Let's go to user, and simply browsing the user table, you'll see for the user that we just modified that the user has a new hash defined, and this is the user. So it's not actually stored. Even though we generated a cryptic password using the built-in function in PHP MyAdmin, the password isn't stored in that format. It's converted to a hash that's compatible with version 5, and, or 4.1 and higher, including 5, and then stored in the hashed value. But the user would need to know the value that was generated. So we made a change on the privileges. Let's find that again. To a given user, we selected a user. We edited the user. And it took us to this particular page where any change that we make here affects the user. The user has all privileges with the exception of grant. And if you recall, if we navigate to the shell and say show grants 
for the user at localhost, it'll show that the user has all privileges minus the grant option, which reflects nicely here. This particular user has all of these privileges minus grant. Whereas if we selected a different user, let's go back and select the root user and examine the privileges for root at, let's say, localhost. Root has all privileges, truly. We'll click on Edit, and you'll see root has all privileges, including grant, no restrictions on resources, and we could add privileges, but there's nothing else to add. So really all we could do for this user is change the password. But again, you can generate a cryptic string, copy it and paste it into both fields, and have it updated in the background. But the user would need to know this string when connecting to MySQL. So we're not going to affect this change because that's a long string. So on a per user basis, you can affect changes such as global password changes and so forth. So there's a lot you can do with PHP MyAdmin. And we've looked at some of the key features, including securing PHP MyAdmin by using an account with only privileges that are necessary. You may export, as we've mentioned, full databases. You pick a database, such as HR3, and simply export it. You can use some of the variables, such as DB, which will give you the DB name in the file name. We haven't shown you this one, but instead of server, click on DB, tell it save it as a file. And when it goes to save it as a file, it'll save it as DB SQL, substituting in the name for you. Then the file exists on the file system as such. So let's take a brief look at Linux CBT's home directory, star.sql, and you'll see that the most recently created file contains the following variable. So you can export the data, you can include the structure as well as the data, or just the structure. There's a lot you can do with PHP MyAdmin, but the keys remain that you are able to use this tool to learn PHP as well as MySQL code. So we're going to log out of this tool for now and we're going to move on to PHP integration with MySQL. We'll return to this tool when necessary to look up certain commands or useful commands that may help us in defining our PHP based code.